two men in the year 1092 stood on the ramparts of a medieval castle. The eagle's nest perched high upon the crags of the Persian mountains. The personal representative of the emperor and the veiled figure who claimed to be the incarnation of God on earth, Hassan son of Sabah, sheikh of the mountains and leader of the assassins, spoke, quote, you see that devotee standing guard on younger turret top? Watch, unquote. He made a signal. Instantly, the white-robed figure threw up his hands in salutation and cast himself 2,000 feet into the foaming torrent which surrounded the fortress. I have 70,000 men and women throughout Asia and each of them ready to do my bidding. Can your master, Malik Shah, say the same? And he asked me to surrender to his sovereignty? This is your answer. Go. Now such a scene may be worthy of the most exaggerated of horror films, and yet it took place in historical fact. The only quibble made by the chronicler of the time was that Hassan's devotees numbered only about 40,000. How this man, Sabah, came by his uncanny power and how his devotees struck terror into the hearts of men from the Caspian to Egypt is one of the most extraordinary of all tales of the secret societies, the mysteries. Today, the sect of the Hashishin, our druggers, still exists in the form of the Ismailis, our Ishmaelites, whose undisputed chief, endowed by them with divine attributes, is the Aga Khan. Like many another secret cult, the assassin organization was based upon an earlier association. And in order to understand how they worked and what their objectives were, we must begin with these roots. One of the most successful secret societies which the Shias founded was centered around the abode of learning in Cairo, which was the training ground for fanatics who were conditioned by the most cunning methods to believe in a special divine mission. In order to do this, the original democratic Islamic ideas had to be overcome by skilled teachers acting under the orders of the Caliph of the Fatimites who ruled Egypt at that time. Members were enrolled on the understanding that they were to receive hidden power and timeless wisdom which would enable them to become as important in life as some of the teachers. And you find these same precepts in every branch in every nationality, on every continent where the mysteries prevail. The Caliph saw to it that the instructors were no ordinary men. The Supreme Judge was one of them. Another was the Commander-in-Chief of the Army. A third, the Minister of the Court. There was no lack of applicants. In any country where the highest officials of the realm formed a body of teachers, one would find the same thing. Classes were divided into study groups, some composed of men, others of women, collectively termed assemblies of wisdom. All lessons were carefully prepared, written down and submitted to the caliph for his seal. At the end of the lecture, all present kissed the seal. For did the caliph not claim direct descent from Muhammad through his son-in-law Ali and thence from Ishmael, the seventh imam? He was the embodiment of divinity, far more than any Tibetan lama ever was. The university, lavishly endowed and possessing the best manuscripts and scientific instruments available, received a grant of a quarter of a million gold pieces annually from the Caliph. Its external form was similar to the pattern of the ancient Arab universities, not much different from Oxford, but its real purpose was the complete transformation of the mind of the student. Students had to pass through nine degrees of initiation, the same number that are claimed in the York Rite of Freemasonry. In the first, the teachers threw their pupils into a state of doubt about all conventional ideas, religious and political. They used false analogy and every other device of argument to make the aspirant believe that what he had been taught by his previous mentors was prejudiced and capable of being challenged. The effect of this, according to the Arab historian Makrizi, was to cause him to lean upon the personality of the teachers as the only possible source of the proper interpretation of facts. 
At the same time, the teachers hinted continually that formal knowledge was merely the cloak for hidden, inner, and powerful truth, whose secret would be imparted when the youth was ready to receive it. None ever questioned why no secret was ever put forth. This confusion technique was carried out until the student reached the stage where he was prepared to swear a vow of blind allegiance to one or other of his teachers. This oath, together with certain secret signs, was administered in due course, and the candidate awarded the first degree of initiation. The second degree took the form of initiation into the fact that the imams, the successors of Muhammad, were the true and only sources of secret knowledge and power. Imams inspired the teachers, therefore the student was to acknowledge every saying and act of his appointed guides as blessed and divinely inspired. In the third degree, the esoteric names of the seven Imams were revealed, and the secret words by which they could be conjured, and by which the powers inherent in the very repetition of their names could be liberated and used for the individual, especially in the service of the sect. In the fourth degree, the succession of the seven mystical lawgivers and magical personalities was given to the learner. These were characterized as Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and Ishmael. There were seven mystical helpers, Seth, Shem, Ishmael, Aaron, Simon, Ali, and Muhammad, the sons of Ishmael. This last was dead, but he had a mysterious deputy who was the Lord of the time, authorized to give his instructions to the people of truth, as the Ismailis called themselves. This hidden figure gave the caliph the power to pretend that he was acting under even higher instructions. The fifth degree named twelve apostles under the seven prophets, whose names and functions and magical powers were described. In this degree, the power to influence others by means of personal concentration was supposed to be taught. One writer claims that this was done merely by the repetition for a period of three years to train the mind of the magical word ak zapt -i. To obtain the sixth degree involved instructions in the methods of analytical and destructive argument in which the postulant had to pass a very stiff examination. The seventh degree brought revelations of the great secret that all humanity and all creation were one and every single thing was a part of the whole, which included the creative and destructive power, the androgynous God. But as an Ishmaeli, the individual could make use of the power which was ready to be awakened within him and overcome those who knew nothing of the immense potential of the rest of humanity. This power came through the aid of the mysterious power called the Lord of the Time. To qualify for the eighth degree, the aspirant had to believe that all religion, philosophy, and the like were fraudulent. All that mattered was the individual who could attain fulfillment only through servitude to the greatest developed power, the Imam. The ninth and last degree brought the revelation of the secret that there was no such thing as belief all that mattered was action, and the only possessor of the reasons for carrying out any action was the chief of the sect. As a secret society, the organization of the Ismailis, as outlined above, was undoubtedly powerful and seemed likely to produce a large number of devotees who would blindly obey the orders of whomever was in control of the edifice. But. As with many other bodies of this kind, there were severe limitations from the point of view of effectiveness. Perhaps the phase of revolt or subversion planned by the society did not in the end get underway. Perhaps it was not intended to work by any other means than training the individual. Be that as it may, its real success extended abroad only to Baghdad in 1058 where a member gained temporary control of Baghdad and coined money in the Egyptian Caliph's name. Now this Sultan was slain by the Turks who now entered the picture and the Cairo headquarters was also threatened. By 1123 the society was closed down by the Vizier Afdal. The rise of Turkish power seemed to have discouraged the expansionist Cairo sect so strongly that they almost faded out, and very little is heard of them after that date. 
It was left to Hassan, son of Sabah, the old man of the mountains, to perfect the system of the ailing secret society and found an organization which has endured for another thousand years. Who was Hassan? Well, he was the son of a Shia, Ali worshipper, and Khorasan, a most bigoted man who claimed that his ancestors were Arabs from Kufa. Now, this assumption was probably due to the fact that such a lineage bolstered up claims to religious importance then as now among Muslims. You see, the people of the neighborhood, many of them also Shias, stated very decisively that this Ali was a Persian, and so were his forebears. So it is generally thought that this is the truer version. As the governor of the province was an orthodox Muslim, Ali spared no efforts to assume the same guise. Now this is considered to be completely permissible, the doctrine of intelligent dissimulation. As there was some doubt as to his reliability in the religious sense, he retired into a monastic retreat and sent his son Hassan to an orthodox school. This school was no ordinary one. It was a circle of disciples presided over by the redoubtable Imam Muafiq, about whom it was said that every individual who enrolled under him eventually rose to great power. It was here that Hassan met Omar Khayyam, the tent maker, poet, and astronomer, later to be the poet laureate of Persia. Another of his schoolmates was Nizam al-Mulk, who rose from peasanthood to become prime minister. These three made a pact, according to Nizam's autobiography, whereby whichever one rose to high office first would help the others, and that tenet has survived to this day. It is how their own infiltrate all levels of society, military, and government, and then pull their brothers up into positions below them. It is the method for infiltrating and controlling large masses, populations, governments, military organizations, and society as a whole. Meanwhile, Hassan remained in obscurity, wandering through the Middle East, waiting for his chance to attain the power of which he had dreamed. Arslan, the lion, died and was succeeded by Malik Shah. Suddenly, Hassan presented himself to Nizam, demanding to be given a place at court. Delighted to fulfill his childhood vow, the vizier obtained for him a favored place and relates what transpired thus in his autobiography. Quote, I had him made a minister by my strong and extravagant recommendations. Like his father, however, he proved to be a fraud, hypocrite, and a self-seeking villain. He was so clever at dissimulation that he appeared to be pious when he was not and before long he had somehow completely captured the mind of the Shah." Unquote. Now Malik Shah was young and Hassan was trained in the Shia art of winning people over by apparent honesty, which means it has the appearance or the look of honesty, but truly is not. But Nizam was still the most important man of the realm with an impressive record of honest dealing and achievements. Hassan decided to eliminate him. The king had asked in that year, 1078, for a complete accounting of the revenue and expenditure of the empire, and Nizam told him that this would take over a year. Hassan, on the other hand, claimed that the whole work could be done in 40 days and offered to prove it. 